Good evening. Welcome. You found us. You found, well, you found Waterloo if you had to find Waterloo. You found our brand new academic center. And this is known as the Van Stone Lecture Hall. So um, I was saying to a couple people today that um, these lectures have started back in 1982. And is it right, Doug, that we have been, we were in that old, that location since 1982? Right. So it's a big deal to move to a new space, but a great space. So welcome. Glad that you could be here. Welcome to the 2016-2017 Lectures in Catholic Experience. And I want to extend a special welcome to any of you who are here at St. Jerome's University for the first time, or maybe for the first time at a lecture, and we're very happy that you could be with us this evening. I want to begin the evening by acknowledging that we are on the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. The university is situated on the Haldeman Tract, the land that was promised to the Six Nations and includes six miles on each side of the Grand River. My name is Christina Vanine and I'm Associate Dean here at St. Jerome's University and I coordinate this lecture series. And I just want to check before we get started with the evening that you have in fact turned off any electronic devices that you might have with you. This is great. I get to see faces this one. This is great. I'm like... In the homily at the opening mass for the Synod on the Family, Pope Francis had this to say about our current global situation. Today we experience the paradox of a globalized world filled with luxurious mansions and skyscrapers, but a lessening of the warmth of homes and families. Many ambitious plans and projects, but little time to enjoy them. Many pleasures, but few loves. Many liberties, but little freedom. The drama of solitude is experienced by countless men and women. He says, I think of the elderly, abandoned even by their loved ones and children, widows and widowers, the many men and women left by their spouses, all those who feel alone, misunderstood, unheard, migrants and refugees fleeing from war and persecution, and those many young people who are victims of a culture of consumerism, a culture of waste, a throwaway culture. The church, he said, is to call to carry out its mission in charity, not by pointing a finger in judgment of others, but rather conscious of its duty to seek out and care for hurting couples with the balm of acceptance and mercy. To be, quote unquote, a field hospital with doors wide open to whoever knocks in search of help and support. To reach out to others with true love, to walk with our fellow men and women who suffer. We are called to be a church which teaches authentic love. This evening, we're fortunate to have with us Dr. Julie Hanlon Rubio, who is Professor of Christian Ethics at St. Louis University, to help us think a bit about Pope Francis's vision for families and for a church that meets people where they are and welcomes all. Dr. Rubio's interdisciplinary research brings the resources of Catholic social thought, social science, and feminist theory to ethical analyses of marriage, family, sex, and gender. Currently, she serves on the boards of the National Catholic Reporter and the National Seminar on Jesuit Higher Education. She's the author of three books, A Christian Theology of Marriage and Family, published by Paulus Press, Family Ethics, Practices for Christians, published by Georgetown Press. Hope for Common Ground, Mediating the Personal and Political in a Divided Church, which is just out this year. And in 2017, her guide to Pope Francis's recent document on family will be published by the Liturgical Press with the title, Reading, Praying, and Living, Pope Francis's The Joy of Love. Dr. Rubio holds a BA in Political Science from Yale University, an MTS from Harvard Divinity School, and a PhD in Religion and Social Ethics from the University of Southern California. She teaches courses in Christian ethics, social justice, 
social ethics and family ethics and politics. In 2016, she received the Excellence in Teaching Award from the Department of Women's and Gender Studies. She regularly gives talks and presentations and workshops on political questions, social questions, social justice, spiritual practices of love and solidarity, and certainly in the last couple of years, Pope Francis. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Julie Hanlon Rubio to speak to us on the topic, Families, Love and Justice, the Vision of Pope Francis. Dr. Thanks, Christina, and thanks to all of you for having me here. I have really loved my day here. I got to talk to a class of students um, this afternoon, and we had a lovely dinner, and I've, I've had Smarties for the first time. So I, I think I'm hooked. I like them. So um, thanks, thanks, Waterloo, right? Um, so what I want to talk about today is love and justice. And my sense throughout my career has been that there are two different audiences in society as well as in the church. There's an audience that would more likely come to hear about love and family, and an audience that would more likely come to hear about justice. There are Christians who consider themselves more family values kinds of people, and Christians who consider themselves more social justice people. They end up on different parish committees, sometimes in different parishes. I see your heads nodding. Yes, this happens here too, right? Not just in my context. <laughs> yeah, it happens in campus ministry. Um, and it happens in secular culture as well. We feel ourselves drawn to these different poles. We have different ideas in politics about where the real problems in society lie. Is, is it the problem of broken families and values, or is it the problem of government and racism and incarceration and immigration and all of those kinds of things. But I think Pope Francis bridges that divide, and I think Catholic social thought bridges that divide. And it's a divide that I've tried to bridge in my own work as well. So I want to present that story to you, the, um, the story of a pope who is a social justice pope who nonetheless really cares deeply about family, but talks about family in a way that is more broadly appealing, so that I think he has a better shot of being heard. But even in talking about it, he's also, he's also, he's coming from the tradition, but he's also taking us forward in the tradition. So I'll, I'll do this in three parts. I'll talk about his social justice cred. Um, I'll talk about the synod on the family that he called, why he did that, and why the process of the synod matters so much for the kind of synthesis he's trying to, trying to make. And then I'll talk about his document, The Joy of Love, which I think is the longest papal document ever. Um, I know, I don't know how many of you have made it through it. I had, I had to read it the afternoon it came out, locked myself in my office, canceled office hours, and made it all the way through. Um, and it's wonderful. It's wonderful. So we'll talk about how he connects faith and justice and all the, love and justice in, in profound ways in each of those areas. So first, why do, why do I call him the social justice pope? Some theologians have said he is remarkably on message, Pope Francis. Almost every time he's speaking, he's talking about recentering the Christian faith on Jesus, on justice, on the poor. He does this not only in what he says, but in what he writes, and in how he is, right? The personal lifestyle choices he's made to not have some of the finery that comes with being a pope, and the ways in which he always is going to the margins, the phrase associated with him, and I, I know I'm lucky to have a colleague who, who has traveled with the Pope on, on almost every papal trip. And, and he says, in every single place, it's not just one, one time, but it's multiple places where the Pope is going to talk to people on the margins. Right? This is remarkable. Along with this, and this is a more complicated point, he, 
he is a social justice pope because he is operating with a different way of moral reasoning. Sometimes we talk about in the Catholic tradition that social thought, when we talk about social issues, it seems to be more open, more developmental, more open to different voices, and a place where we might expect people in the church to disagree. We don't have, all, have to have the exact same opinion about how to combat poverty. And that's OK. Whereas when we talk about issues related to sex and gender and family, we tend to have a more rigid ethical method, less room for diversity, and less room for development. What the Pope has done is made our moral reasoning unified. And the moral reasoning that he lays out, which is open and listening and humble and expecting of some diversity, is one he applies not just to social ethics issues, but also to family ethics issues. And that's a really important move. So let, let me show you some of that and what he's written. So some of you may have heard about Laudato Si, his major encyclical on the environment. And of course, a big part of that encyclical is, is how he asks us to expand our notion of justice to include the earth and the creatures of the earth. So he says that we have been excessively anthropocentric, right, focused on human beings, and we haven't thought enough about the earth or its creatures. So that means that some of our social teaching needs to be updated. And even the way we've talked about the biblical text in Genesis by focusing on the word dominion in Genesis is going to have to be corrected, essentially, with more of a focus on responsible stewardship of the earth. One of my friends who's an ecclesiologist says, I think the catechism is going to need to be updated now because he has moved us along, <laughs> right? So he's pulling us to the center. He's recentering Christian faith on justice and also expanding our notions of that, developing, moving us forward. In his document, Evangelii Gaudium, he brought social concern to, the, to moral theology. So in talking about very basic ideas about how to be a moral person, he kept talking about poverty. He kept talking about concern for those who are left out. He said, before all else, the gospel invites us to respond to the God of love who saves us, to see God in others, and to go forth from ourselves to seek the good of others. That's the core. Okay. And then what that meant is there was going to be a little less emphasis on certain issues that people were used to hearing a lot from the church about. So he's, he's moving the center there. He defined poverty as a life issue. He says poverty kills. You have to remember that. Poverty kills. So we have to say, thou shalt not, he says, to an economy of inequality and exclusion. This recentering right, is fundamentally important. And so is his ability to say, we focus on wh where people are hurting. And if our theology is insufficient, we acknowledge that and we try to move forward. Now, it would seem then that maybe we should have a synod on poverty, on global poverty, right, or the environment. But that's not what he did. But I think it was a brilliant call to have this synod on marriage and family. Now, my friends say, of course you think it's brilliant, Julie. That's what you've been studying all these years. Um, but really, it's not just that. Um, this is a tool that hasn't been used much since it was defined at the end of the Second Vatican Council, but it's a tool that gives the Pope the ability to call the bishops of the world together and consult with them. And I think Pope Francis knew that if he wants to heal the church, if he wants to extend mercy to people, marriage and family is where people feel like they need mercy, where they need healing. 
So that's where he needed to begin. And he needed to show that even there, the church could be a listening church, a humble church, a developing church. And I think that's what we saw at the Synod. So one thing that's really important about the Synod is that the bishops tried to listen. So before they all went to Rome and started fighting with each other, which is what they did, right, they sent out surveys. Right? And one might think, well, why do you need a survey? We all know what Catholic teaching is on these questions. Why do you need to ask people what they think about it? But in fact, the Vatican directed bishops to in some way find out what people thought about it. And they did not all do it the same way, but in many dioceses throughout the world, people were asked for their opinions. This was really important. All of those surveys made their way some way to Rome. And it was very clear that the committees among the bishops and their staffs read these surveys. And then when they wrote early um, preparatory documents for the synod, they told us what was in those surveys. And they told us, honestly, things like a lot of, there's a lot of what theologians call non-reception out there. That means teachings are promulgated, but they're not received. Sometimes people know what they are, but they don't know why they are what they are. And sometimes they don't understand the basis for them, or they just don't agree with them, or they don't feel like they can live them out even if they wanted to. And that's what these bishops acknowledged in their documents that they took with them to the synod. They acknowledged that there was diversity of opinion about things like gender, whether it's possible to keep a lifelong marriage vow, polygamy, same-sex union, cohabitation, contraception, all of those things. So all of the sudden, it was out on the table. <laughs> we were not pretending that all Catholics thought all the same things all the time. So they listened. That seems to me is really important if you want to want to treat people in the church with justice, which is an essential step of calling them then to practice justice. What else did they do at the Synod? Well, they said, like Francis has always said, let's focus on the essentials. <laughs> they tried to focus on the essentials. So instead of focusing on very specific rules and controversial things, they tried to talk just about marriage and why it matters. And they tried to use language people could actually understand. They said, we get it. The whole natural law stuff that we've been talking, it just doesn't resonate with people. We write about marriage, and they don't recognize their own marriages in the language of our documents. One quote from, some of the, uh, from a, uh, the final document that came out of the Synod is, marriage about marriage is in the liberty of the yes exchanged by the man and woman for their whole lives, the love of God is made present and is experienced. It's the yes. Or this on parenting. In their union and love, spouses experience the beauty of paternity and maternity. They share plans and fatigue. I've never seen that, doc that in a Catholic document. Plans and fatigue. <laughs> Desire and preoccupation. They learn to take care of each other and to forgive each other. Or families where we learn to live with each other despite our differences and to belong. This is a big step for them to hear what people actually value and experience in their marriage and family and try to communicate that in essential ways. Pope Francis also took his signature mercy to the Synod. And, at, and he keeps saying, we need to offer mercy before judgment. Right? It doesn't mean he doesn't make judgments. I know he's known for being non-judgmental, for saying, who am I to judge? I actually think Francis is judging all the time. Right? That's because he's a prophet. I mean, right? He's always telling us what we're doing wrong. But he manages to do that because he offers mercy first. Essential. So mercy, talking about what does keep people away from church. What, it, what might be good in cohabiting relationships, even if they aren't all that we would want? 
is there a way in which people are moving toward the ideal that we hold up? He also took a signature part word that I have never seen in any teaching on sex or family, but only in social thought, which is accompaniment. That's a word I know from social justice circles, right? not moral theology. But there it is. It was there from the very first interviews that Pope Francis gave. And he means by that to keep company with, to walk with, not to try to solve people's problems right away or preach at them, but to listen, to suffer with. So if we can do that when we go on service trips or when we're working with people who are suffering, this is what the church also wants to do with people who are wounded in their marital and family lives. The Synod Father said, the church wants to be a light for the wounded, for those in the midst of the storm. Finally, one of the most important things that came out of the decision of the Synod, I think, is that we knew that the Synod Fathers disagreed, but that Pope Francis told them, keep talking and kick no one out. Again, often on marriage and family, that's not what we hear. Often people aren't allowed to voice disagreement. Often they are told to leave the room, but not in the Senate. Everybody was there. And that meant the conservatives, too. Some of the liberals were like, well, why aren't you more on, more on our side? Shouldn't you kick out? No, everybody stays. <laughs> right? And everybody talks. And they don't make a document that they can't all agree on. And Francis actually said in his final speech at the Senate, it would have been really disappointing not to have debate like this. I love that. <laughs> right? So important to know that the Pope says, yeah, we're going to have debate on these questions. That's what it means to be church. So here we have in the Synod listening, dialogue, an emphasis on humility, an emphasis on the essentials, mercy, disagreement, and diversity. But the Synod itself actually doesn't have very much power. It can have all the documents it wants, but those documents don't actually have a ton of authority. Right? It's, it's an advisory kind of meeting. So we didn't know, once the synod happened, what was going to happen next. It wasn't clear. But then, fairly soon after, Francis decided to, read, um, to, to write his own document, The Joy of Love. And there, he connected marriage and social justice, bringing both in substance and in method in really profound ways. Now, I'm not telling you the whole thing is amazing reading, but definitely, definitely parts of it. The first thing to say, though, is that the Pope is, um, is not making this up. That is, the connection between family and social justice is not something that is completely new. I think that's important to say. Sometimes there's a tendency on the left to want to say Pope Francis is our guy, and John Paul II and Benedict, they just didn't get it. In you know, some ways, those, that's true. But really, really, Pope Benedict and John Paul II had all kinds of beautiful social documents as well. And they also talked about the social role of the family. So Pope Francis was able to draw upon, in fact, he consciously drew upon previous popes to root his teaching in their teaching. So that's kind of what popes do to show I'm, I'm staying within the tradition even though I'm pulling it along. So he was able to draw on important phrases like the family is the first cell of society. It's the school of deeper humanity or the family has a social mission. Or as John Paul II said, far from being closed in on itself, the family is by nature and vocation open to other families in society. And that's why it undertakes a social role. When you think about rhetoric in our culture about family as a refuge, as a safe haven, as a place to retreat from the world, even read about, read real estate ads. Right? Your, your master bedroom is your retreat. It's like a spa. It's like a hotel. Right? Think of all that retreat language. Right? 
right? John Paul II is saying no, right? It's all about being open. So Pope Francis had all that to build upon, but then he took it further. So one thing he did is something that is really typical, more typical in our social justice documents. He started by doing what Gaudium et Spes called reading the signs of the times. So usually when we do marriage and family teaching, we tend to start with, here's what we've always said, and here's how it still applies. We'll say it a little nicer, right? But that's kind of the method. Here he starts with that more social ethics method and says, let's read the sign of the times. But he also didn't turn around and say, everything's awful. No one respects family anymore. It's all ridiculous, right? He didn't want to say that either. He actually starts as a sign of the time with, with the experience of love and joy that people know in their families. Let's start there. He wants to acknowledge that even those whose families are imperfect experience that joy and deep relationship often, not always. And then he turned to the things that he saw as problematic. And he talked about things that we might expect him to talk about, about cohabitation, about single parenthood, lone parenthood, divorce. But he also talked about other things that, I, that are consistent themes in his, in his speaking, about loneliness and alienation, restlessness that prevents us from keeping commitments, individualism, and a romanticism. A romanticism that suggests to us that we're going to find the one perfect person that is going to meet every need and fulfill everything that he thinks is really destructive. He also talked about social phenomenon that shaped the ability of people to keep marriage vows. So instead of keeping marriage and family over here and migration and poverty and trafficking and incarceration over here, he said, these things are totally linked, right? When people are incarcerated, it's hard to keep families together. When people are migrating for work, it breaks up families. And so these are things that make it hard for people. and We have to recognize them as part of the social context. It's not just that people don't have family values anymore although he would acknowledge some of that when he talks about individualism, romanticism, right? But there's also a social context out there that's making it really hard. In the US, we talk about two marriage cultures. I don't know if you have a similar language here. That is, the people who tend to have more privilege and more education are following the traditional marriage script, actually, even if they might have more liberal views. It's the people who have less education and less privilege who are marrying less, cohabiting more, divorcing more, and really feeling the wounds of that in their context. So marriage brings with it, marriage exacerbates privilege, and living outside of that can exacerbate lack of privilege. And so there are graphs that just keep going like this um, that sociologists us about. So he, he acknowledged some of that social context. And so he says, in that context, I want to speak into that context. I want to offer some wisdom from the tradition. But he also said, I'm not going to answer all the questions. Another thing we don't tend to have in marriage and family, <laughs> on marriage and family, right? I'm not going to give you everything. Some priests have come to me now frustrated like, why didn't he just lay down a new rule about divorced people, divorced or remarried people in communion like we wanted to? I needed an answer. He said, that's not the kind of pope he wants to be. We'll talk about the particulars of that in Q&A if you want. But that's, that wasn't the main point. It was, I know in the news coverage that maybe if you followed it, that seemed to be the main point. There are a lot of other points that are more fundamental, and he didn't want to be laid down rules. He remembered in this document of his the, the synod as this vibrant process full of debate and disagreement, um, and in doing so, legitimated that. And so that's our process. That's who, who we are as church. So now in that context, he says, let me give you some wisdom. 
And then, in another move that I think is, is really unique, he speaks, this is in section four in the document where some people say you should start. He speaks directly to couples in language that is not made for people like me, not made for theologians. It's made for me as a, as a partner, as a spouse, but not, not as a theologian so much. Very down to earth. And he speaks with respect. And he starts out by admitting flaws in the church's teaching, too much focus on procreation, lofty ideals, and a lack of, res without like grounding it in experience, and a lack of respect for conscience. One of the most famous lines from the document now is, we've been called to form consciences, not replace them. So he wants to form, but not to replace people's own discernment. So he starts there. Now I'm listening, right? right? When you start with self-criticism and an admission that you don't have all the answers, then people are more willing to listen. Then he shares the wisdom, and he knows that the question he needs to answer is, why get married? In many parts of the world, yes. In the US, actually, although people are getting married, we're still pretty positive about marriage. But in a lot of parts of the world, not so much. And, these, and certainly the question of why stay married or why, matter, why marriage matters, why it's worth it to stay and love for a lifetime. Those are questions that we haven't done a great job of answering. And so he starts to talk then about marriage as friendship. Much more helpful, I think. Probably the way people experience it a little bit more. As intimacy, as warmth, stability, shared life very down-to-earth language. He has to talk about indissolubility or the Catholic idea that marriage, it's not that marriage that you shouldn't get divorced, but that you can't. Indis marriage is indissoluble. It's a very difficult and controversial theological concept, and there are exceptions right, of a kind. But he wants to talk about that not as a rule that you must obey. It is that way, therefore you can't violate it. But more as something that, an ideal that makes sense that you want to live into. So he spends a lot of time talking about how it's not going to be always awesome. right? He says love doesn't have to be perfect for us to value it even when the other person is not loving us well, when they're loving us the best they can with all their limits, then love is still real. Now, he makes a distinction here. Like, sometimes people aren't loving you. Sometimes people are not treating you with sufficient dignity, and there is a time then where you have to depart. Right? People deserve respect. But when people are loving you imperfectly, that's normal. Right? <laughs> So he says, you know, we love people even when they're infirm and elderly, unattractive. This word appears several times. I don't know why, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, and he realizes in some really poignant passages that sometimes in marriage people feel unseen and unappreciated. So he says, love opens our eyes and enables us to see beyond all, all else the great worth of a human. That's social justice, in a sense. It's the dignity of every human person, despite who they are, despite their age, right, their illness, their attractiveness, any of that, the worth of a human being. He tries to call couples to growth. Marriage is not this static thing, right? He says you need to cultivate intimacy, joy, spends a long time talking about good communication, in which he says, and by the way, if you're going to have good communication, you need to have something to say. Don't be boring. <laughs> right? Accept, over and over again, accept imperfection. That's part of marriage. And one might say that accepting imperfection and learning to love through that, you're preparing yourself to love beyond the bonds of family as well. Now, it's not all imperfection. Um, he also 
has some lovely passages on the Song of Songs that other popes have not wanted to touch. Um, talks about sexual passion in marriage. In fact, I wrote about that a little bit for um, for the Washington Post in a blog piece, and they and they, you know, of course, took my first paragraph and totally changed it. And the headline just becomes, you know, Pope Francis, the sexy pope. And I'm like, no, <laughs> right? <laughs> but there is some of it there. There's some of it there. There are also some beautiful passages from Martin Luther King in a document on Catholic marriage and family, right, who the Pope also raised up um, in, a, in a speech to Congress as a great American. And um, what he takes from King is love of enemies. Love of enemies and the need for forgiveness. And of course, King said, you know, you have to love your enemy not because they're right. You know, you offer forgiveness even when it's undeserved. Because you know that the person is always more than the worst thing that they have done. That he wants to apply to marriage. So instead of just saying, stay married, <laughs> he really narrates the day-to-day -day process of being in a loving relationship, encouraging, really appreciating, contemplating, growing in your love and growing into marriage through life into this experience of belonging completely to another person. So then fidelity becomes not this burden, not this thing that you have to do because you're Catholic, but rather this thing that, this, this ideal that you're aspiring to. Mimicking, he says, mimicking God, who is always close and never abandons us. So of course, he knows, that not everybody is going to be able to achieve this ideal. There's some worry in the theological community about whether he talked too much about ideals and then, and then what we do when people don't meet the, meet the ideals. We can also talk about that if you would like. But he knows that so much. And so then he uses this term, accompaniment, to talk about how we deal with, with, with it when people don't, don't, aren't able to keep to that ideal that we still hold up in such high esteem. So in the sections that are directed to pastors, there he's saying, you need to figure out ways, because I'm not going to give you all the answers. There's no blueprint. You need to figure out the ways to walk with people who are wounded in their marriages and their families. So figure it out, right? Figure out the premarital preparation. Figure out how do you form people into the kind of people who can stay married to people who aren't perfect. Okay? How do you do that? Right? That's a lot of virtue formation. He says our laws, our moral laws, are not stones to throw at people's lives. So figure out how you can put these ideals out there, but also walk with people. This idea of the field hospital that Christina mentioned is so important. He wants the parish to be that, especially around issues of marriage and family and homosexuality. Right? What, something that came through in the surveys was not that every, all Catholics in the world had the same view on that subject. They don't. The Global South is very much at odds with, with, uh, with US and Europe on that issue. But consistently, people said that we need to figure out a way to welcome people not to exclude people. How can we be, be the field house? There is good evidence that, in fact, the churches not serve as a field house. That is, for instance, that our Protestant churches do far better in welcoming people who have divorced, who have difficult family situations, but people who divorce are much more likely to leave when they're Catholic because they don't feel that there's any longer a place for them, and Pope Francis wants that to change. Now, some of this he has mandated. Uh, there are some reforms in the annulment process that are kicking in right away. And he repeats several times in the document that people who are divorced are not excommunicated, right? He wants them to know that, that they are still um, welcome. They are children of God. They have gifts that they can share with our community, et cetera. And he does this while also balancing concern for children of divorce who also bear, can bear wounds. So in all of this accompaniment, there is respect and valuing for persons where they are. 
and a sense that the appropriate thing is to leave the details of how to do that to the local communities. Finally, he offers in this document an outward facing vision. In fact, we don't have much of a romantic theology of marriage in the Christian tradition. The culture is way more romantic, way more romantic. The marriage liturgy is really not very romantic. That's why people need to bring things like unity candles. I don't know how many of these things you have. Unity stands, um, extra music, um, extra readings, because our liturgy just doesn't talk about those things very well. And that's because it's about something more. It's about the two, but it's about something much more. So that's why, although Francis talks, spends a lot of time talking about love, he also asks couples not to just stare into each other's eyes, right, but to look beyond themselves and walk hand in hand toward others. Because they, like everyone else in the church, the single people, the divorced people, the widowed people, all the people, are disciples first. Marriage is just one specification of that. It's one way of being Christian. So he says families shouldn't see themselves as a refuge from society. They should go forth from their homes in a spirit of solidarity with others. And that way they become a hub for integrated, integrating persons. He also quotes, this is one of the things he does that's so radical for popes. Normally, they just quote each other. Quote other popes. Um, Pope Francis doesn't do that. He quotes regular people, um, not sometimes people who aren't even priests. Um, and one thing he quotes in this document is a poem by um, a South American poet, ben Benedetti. And it goes like this, your hands are my caress, the harmony that fills my days. I love you because your hands work for justice. If I love you, it's because you're my love, my companion, my all. And on the street, side by side, we are much more than just two. It's beautiful, evocative language. There's not much detail. That's OK. He's leaving it to us. We get to figure that part out. I think that Francis is not off the mark in linking love and justice this way. If you think about the gospel, not only is there not much romance, there's not much family. I was writing an article recently for, for a magazine and trying, trying to think how many married couples are there. Besides Mary and Joseph, think about the shepherds and the wise men and the prodigal son's father and the widow who searches for the lost coin and all these people I kept thinking and the uh, Jairus's Jairus and his da daughter yes um, yeah all these stories they're all single they're all single isn't that interesting and think about the tables the meals in the gospel there's none there are none where we have a father and a mother and children Turkey. Um, <laughs> that's, that's another vision, right? That's Norman Walkwell for those of us in the US. I think there, you find more of that vision in, in the Mormon church, where family really is center. But if you look at our gospel, if you look at our, the meals in the gospel, it's a very different kind of table. This is the table where Jesus is the head, mm -hmm. right? And the people there are a great variety of seekers and disciples and sinners and outsiders, and they're all there. And we know right, that Jesus was called out by people at his time for eating with sinners. So if we want to think about the table, right, the meal, the family meal, I think it makes sense to think about that because it's the church that is called family in the Gospels. That's why they call each other brother and sisters. So it's the people of, from all walks of life 
listening, being formed as disciples by the master who walks in the ways of love and justice so that they can go and do likewise. That's the vision that Francis wants to communicate, that love and justice, inclusivity, diversity, fidelity, all of that belongs together. Thanks for listening, and I look forward to our continuing conversation. So we've got microphones. We've got four of them. So those of you up there don't have to go too far. So we have two here and two back there. And I'm going to let Julie manage the questions. So make your way down. Ask what you'd like to ask. Get some conversation going. And I did avoid some of the controversial issues. And if you'd like to ask me about them, I'm more than happy to ask uh, to answer questions about them. All fair game. Thank you for your uh, lecture. I, um, I have to admit that I did not read the final report, Emily, nor did I read whatever Pope Francis uh, wrote after. Part of the reason is that I was quite disappointed in the first report and even more so in, I think it was called the linea mento, which was meant to be something like the discussion paper mm -hmm. uh, for the assembly uh, last year. Uh, and so I ask a question, or uh, maybe I, I come in, um, about the assembly rather than about what you talked about. Because I think too, and you already referred to this, that in actual practice of every day, it is what the bishop and what mm. the bishops tell the priests to do, which is also written. I, I don't want to underestimate that, but I think that ultimately it comes down the local level. With respect to that, I have a question. Um, I thought the fundamental problem, and I know what you're coming from, I thought the fundamental problem with the document of, of this was that from the beginning, there was absolutely no way that the church's official teaching on marriage and family this position was reflected in the question and, of course, was reflected in the answer. So you did not get a true picture of what marriage and family was like. By the way, my, I'm a social psychologist. Mm -hmm. I'm a social scientist and I, I have studied marriage and family. So that is one of the things I, I did not recognize in the document the reality of marriage. Mm, mm, mm -hmm. Part of that, again, was the, the starting position was the magisterians, uh, the magisterium cannot teach. That surprised me uh, for a number of reasons, but also because, and you, I think you were referring to but you can correct me as I'm wrong, if I'm wrong. I think there was very little on marriage and family, on marriage and family in, the, in the early history of the church. As a matter of fact, if I'm informed correctly, there was not a blessing of the marriage until the 10th until or the 11th century. It didn't become a sacrament mm -hmm. until the, what was it, the 12th or 13th century. So I don't, that's, that puzzles me. Why, given that, given that history, why was it, uh, why was the magisterium decided? Thank you. I appreciate all that. 
So um, I could see how someone reading some of the documents would be would be disappointed. As the theologians are trained to read documents in a certain way, um, one of the things we look for is what's being said and what's what's not being said. And what's being said but not being said vehemently. So I, I think that is very true that there were kept being assertions. No teachings are going to change. We're going we're talking about pastoral solutions. Yes. Um, and that, in fact, is true, although one might say that, and there's ongoing debate about this, but I think the best argument that I can see is that Francis did open the door for communion for those who have been divorced without an annulment and remarried. So I think that that is a change. He also did a couple other things, though. For instance, on contraception. Contraception was a huge focus in the pontificate of John Paul II. Um, it continued in Benedict. It's been, a, it's been a central aspect of Catholic teaching on marriage and family. In fact, some, some people who read the document, um, The Joy of Love, too quickly, secular commentators said, oh, there's nothing in here on contraception, because I think they Google searched for contraception. <laughs> and it, and that, that isn't the word that's used. But there, there is a very brief statement restatement of the church's teaching. But that's all there is okay, in this whole document. right? And so what that means, Francis is saying, I'm a loyal son of the church. We are not going to change that teaching. OK. But he, what he's not saying is what John Paul II said. So what John Paul II said was, was, was not only is this the teaching, but those couples who are using artificial contraception are, in fact, lying to their spouses with their bodies, degrading the act of sexuality, disrespect. I mean, the language is really strong. We're talking about two Christian people who are making love. I mean, that, that was his language. Not there. Right? That is not there in Francis. Um, instead, he reserves his harshest condemnation for sexual and domestic violence. He said this over and over in the document. This is what disrespects the heart of Christian marriage. So did he change it? No. But, it, but in the church, when we say it less, <laughs> when we talk about it less, um, we're leaving it behind. Uh, similarly with same-sex marriage. Now that's a lot long. That's uh, a different issue. Similarly, he repeats with quotes from what earlier documents said very briefly and moves on. Who's done? Um, he is not going to be a culture warrior. He is not going to make this the center of his, of his pontificate. This whole document is about something else. Now, sometimes people say to me, "Well, he didn't. He just changed the tone. You know, what does all this stuff really mean?" I, I, I think it's it's crucially important what he's not saying, what he's not focusing on, and all the mercy and all the all the inclusiveness. And he's saying, Let, "Let's focus over here." What are you going to do in those families? How are you going to love that person? How are you going to work for justice with your kids? And it seems to me that it's much easier for then for people who are divorced and remarried, who are in blended families, who are in single parent families, who are using contraception, who are in same sex marriages, to say, I can do that. I can do that. Or I can try. So, so there, I think there are significant moves. Is it, is it what many of us would want to hear? No, certainly not. Not the whole. By a previous Synod of Bishops, 1971, when there, one of the opening statements was action on behalf of justice, and the transformation of society appear to us constituent of Jesus' message. 
And it really, for the first time in my life, put justice at the center of Jesus' message. I used to think prayer was, and anyway, it's really led me on a, a, a justice journey. And in keeping with the university you work at, Jesuit University, uh, Jim and Kathy McGinnis uh, wrote a series of books on parenting for peace and justice, yeah. uh, bringing together family and justice. Uh, my wife and I were the coordinator of that for Canada, and it's influenced our lives tremendously. And so for me, it was just pure joy <laughs> to hear uh, your emphasis of uh, justice for all people, especially your partner within the families. Uh, it was a wonderful uh, tying together of what my life has been uh, working for justice and with my 44 year marriage to my wife who couldn't be here tonight, but I'm gonna tell her. <laughs> and so I just want to uh, thank you. Uh, I'm a huge believer in Pope Francis's outreach of compassion to the most vulnerable. And to be honest, in reference to the last speaker, uh, it does have to be implemented locally by the bishops, but we all know that the bishops for the last 30 years have been appointed in the JP2 and Benedict sense. And so this new focusing of Jesus's message to uh, reach out as shepherds to the sheep and therefore smell like the sheep and go where the sheep are is uh, a wonderful gift to us, I believe, and it's appreciated, I think, not only by Catholics, but many of my uh, non-Catholic friends, mm -hmm. admire mm -hmm. Francis's reach out, especially also regarding the uh, environment. So, more of a comment than a question. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, the um, for those who, who don't know, Kathleen and James McGinnis in, um, in St. Louis started this Parenting for Peace and Justice Network, and it was one of the things that attracted me to the, to the university um, as well, and there were, there are just, they inspired, along with also, I don't know if you, uh, some of you may know, a, uh, a Jesuit philosopher at my university named John Cavanaugh used to write in America and wrote a book, Following Christ in a Consumer Society. And, and they influenced networks of like-minded people in St. Louis. But honestly, they felt somewhat alone. And actually, I, I wrote my dissertation in 1995 on, I tried to write a social ethic of the family. And I used books like the McGinnis, which were more popular books because that's all there was. Um, and, and so now, and I tried to put that into a kind of more sophisticated theological form. But now we're seeing this at the higher levels. But I think people have been living it also um, in different kinds of communities uh, for a very long time. I wanted to say a word about the bishops, too. I didn't answer that well. It is true that um, this is one of those situations where liberal Catholics are like, we want the Pope to be authoritarian, right? Um, <laughs> right. Um, and, but he's, he's not going to do that. And, um, and that's going to be difficult. Uh, and it is true that this round of bishops has been, has been appointed. Um, they're going to be around for a while. Now, they're not getting, they're not getting the red hats. Right? They're not being called to, uh, to Rome to be cardinals right now. Clearly, Francis picked centrist cardinals. That will influence um, the church in years to come. And I hear from my Jesuit friends that the, the priests coming in, the scholastics coming in, are definitely more becoming Pope Francis guys. And, um, and I think that there's, there's going to be a different kind of focus. There's something also that's just, I don't know if they, if they are going to be able to resist the tide because there is such a deep appeal to this message. And I've been struck by that too. this too. First of all, broad appeal among Catholics, liberal and conservative, except on the very edges. Right? And also, I mean, I've been on radio shows about Pope Francis and half the people will call in to talk about how great Pope Francis is are atheists. Right, everybody, we love your pope. <laughs> Don't like your religion, that's weird, but, but your pope. <laughs> right, um, so, so there's, something, there's something about this movement I think that's going to have to be implemented. Now, it is true that there's a, a conservative um, bishop, Chaput, 
who is in charge uh, in, in the US of the implementation. I don't know who's in charge here. So this will have some, some effects. But there are also people meeting in parishes all over the place, and they're going to decide things like, what is our ministry to divorced Catholics? Um, how do we take account of the fact that some of our kids are coming from same-sex couples to our parish religious education? How do we acknowledge that reality? Uh, what, what, what can we do? And so I think parish life is still possibly going to look differently. And, and this, this movement toward open disagreement, I think, can't be understated. When, so when I go to parishes and people say, well, we can't talk about that. You know? And I think, well, the bishops were disagreeing with each other. Pope Francis said that was OK. What are you, what are you afraid of? Like, let's, let's talk. I, I, think, I think this is the moment to talk and, and see what happens. So I know, I know the bishops are, are, have power, but I'm optimistic that some things can happen. Am I not controversial enough? No. <laughs> I don't. I know that's a rumor that that um, that that would be the case, but I don't. I don't know any more than that. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. You all have a history together. You know who asked the question. And there's a, quite a bit I like to say, but I'll keep it relatively brief. That's I've attended uh, a couple of uh, synods of bishops. I've seen the Catholic bishops in Canada go from left to right. And I have seen the uh, international press comment on it. What's happened in Canada? And what happens in Canada is leadership. As an academic, I was around when Excordia Ecclesiae was being written and debated. This is a document on Catholic universities. One of the things it says is Catholic universities must challenge social structures, except the social structure of the church. And that's always bothered me. And uh, I've been in situations where I've seen it challenged and in Rome, and I have had a cardinal say, the reason that we don't challenge the church, the social structure, is the church is a mystery. Period. I mean, you'd like to see some practical results from some of the things that get said and done. I suspect hardly anybody knows that I think it was 1984, the bishops of Quebec apologized for create, helping to create stereotypes. What they concluded was, women are going to confession, and they've been beaten by their husbands. And the <coughs> advice they were getting, first of all, was, well, what did you do? And they understood that the church has played a really negative role in developing proper marriages and social structures. And uh, as someone, and I've published a book, by the way, on uh, marriage and uh, sexuality and marriage in the Catholic tradition. And uh, I'm skeptical, OK? And I think I have good reason to be skeptical. So enlighten me. Take away my skepticism. So the question is, is as I take it, a skepticism that, that a church that has moved um, far to the right and has been um, complicit in creating problems does not want to change. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, I'm not going to tell you there's no reason for skepticism. Um, yeah, we don't like to say that we change. We like to say in our documents, as we have always said, right, before saying something different, right? Um, so I think, I mean, one of the things that I, I feel like the job of, it's the job of theologians to say, we have changed, right? have changed. So it's, as we heard earlier, right, our, our theology and practice of marriage has changed. Yeah, we did not have the liturgy that we have now. Right? We didn't have anything like it right, until the Middle Ages. We didn't have precise rules about it, even until Trent. Right? Um, it has, and, and if anybody thinks that the biblical family that would be a good idea, actually. Look at the biblical families, right? Um, is what we have now, or that, that there's something be, like there's that and the traditional family. Those aren't the same thing. And you can look at our teaching on men and women in marriage. It's changed. So when I show my students what was said in Casti Canubi in 1931, they, they actually actually misread, they misinterpret what the Pope says because they can't believe that this is in a Catholic document, right? But it says there's an order in the family, and the man is the head and the woman is the heart, and, she sh and there should not be a, 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 an unnatural equality. That would be a problem. And they say women who desire to work outside the home, right, are denying their dignity. They're coming down from their throne. Um, it's not what we say anymore, right? So now we talk about equal dignity. Now we talk about mutuality. Now we say you're not her slave. She's not your slave. You're not her master, right? Um, we say that we try to keep... Uh, John Paul II jumps through all kinds of hoops to say, yes, Ephesians 5 is good and, and that there, um, there is submission. But really what he says is there's mutual submission of men and women to each other, which is not the way theologians have interpreted that text throughout Christian history. So I, it's part, part of what Christian theologians and ordinary Christians need to do is say, yes, we have changed. And we've changed even on issues of marriage and family. Or take sexuality. Read Augustine on sexuality and then read John Paul II. I mean, Augustine would have thought John Paul II was, would be awful. Right? All this joy and sex, that sex is holy, and, and we're, I mean, a popular commentator like Christopher West who riffs on John Paul II, I mean, sex is like Eucharist. I mean, way, no way would the early church have recognized that kind of thinking, right? So the positive view that we have of sexuality, even our teaching on contraception, I mean, earlier in the church's history, the teaching was not that you should be open to procreation, but that you should be intending procreation. And even then, Augustine, Aquinas, sex is still kind of sinful. Still. And then even when, when the rhythm method is proposed, um, all kinds of theologians are really worried about that. They don't think... Now we think of NFP, that's like the really super virtuous people. No, when it came out at the time, people thought, well, wait a minute. You're not willing to accept God's will. What if you are selfish in the pursuit of pleasure? But then gradually, it came, NFP became the benchmark. If you're using that method and not artificial contraception, then that's, that is abiding in God's will. But using, using the tools of science that God gave us to understand when women ovulate, when how not to get pregnant. So I think you can look at all of these different things and say, there's been significant change. We don't like to talk about it. We never say, and now we're changing, right? But we do. And so that gives me hope, right? And it's something I'm, it's a central part of every ethics class I teach, because I want my students to understand. You know, it may look like it never changes. They may say they never change, but we do, and that means that we can change again. Thank God we changed on slavery. I'm not so sure about usury. 
very happy about gender and would like to see us change a little more. Now it's slow change. Slow. Yep. Yeah. So there, I mean, I hope that, I, I don't know that Francis is remembering those parts of John Paul II and carrying them forward. He's remembering other parts of him, and I hope that's how, how we'll move. He's, he, yeah, he's, He's remembering the social mission of the family. He's remembering other things and, and trying to move forward in that way. I, I don't want to underestimate the, um, the difficulty, um, particularly in certain areas of the world and of the country. But it also seems to me that this is a place where, where lay people can have enormous influence. in groups like Parenting for Peace and Justice, don't know what other groups that you have here, where people gather together in small communities and talk about how to live marriage and family. There's enormous potential for people to talk to each other. We had a group in, um, in our own parish, just parents gathering, a lot of wisdom shared in that group. A lot of life wisdom over the years, a lot of support, a lot of accompaniment, right? Those kinds of groups, I think, can be enormously influential so that if somebody would hear from a priest something as awful as, what did you do, that the other people around say, that's, that's wrong. wrong. And I think that Francis invites people to own that responsibility. And I think about my own students right now who are being formed on our campus, very concerned about issues of diversity, of inclusion, of violence, of assault. Their consciousness is so different, so different. Those are the same kids that are in, active in campus ministry. They're organizing Pride Week. They're doing all these same things together. They're, they're going to be different. They're going to ask for a different church, or they might leave. Right, that's, that's a possibility, too. But I don't think... Um, I think they're just gonna they're gonna take it in different directions. That's my hope. So I think yeah, go ahead. Um, we have four grown sons, and uh, it disturbs me to read the bulletins in the churches that they attend. And there's usually a section on marriage, and it defines the criteria that the, um, one of the two couples, one of the couple has to live in the boundaries of the church for um, months to a year. I can't just remember them all, but um, so the, these are churches where we have our cottage. These are churches where our children attend in Toronto. Very disinviting um, so that if, if two young people have gone and lived away and they want to be married, there are such tremendous barriers to access to the sacrament that it's just astounding. And I've tried approaching, um, not with my real name, <laughs> the priests in these parishes to draw to their attention how unwelcoming this um, ministry of marriage is. And they respond by saying, I will not apologize. I can't manage to do what I'm doing now 
I couldn't possibly marry the children of the people that live in this parish if they want to come back to be married, for instance. So it really encourages young couples to cohabitate because they're not, they're not being welcomed to the sacrament. So they miss the grace, they miss the blessings that might help them be successful. I think it's sinful what um, that the, these statements are in these bulletins. Um, and maybe we need to open the charism to other people. Maybe priests don't have to marry couples. And by the way, you have to be married in a church. So if you want to be married where God is on a mountainside or in a pasture, um, the bishops don't allow the priests to do that. And if the priest gets a dispensation from his bishop, the bishop in the place can, can counteract that. So you see, many non-Catholic couples get married anywhere, right? It's interesting that the church is in Niagara-on-the-Lake where nobody lives, but they all want to go and be married at the winery. Those churches can marry people who don't live anywhere near there. Why? It just... Uh, but what worries me is that the young people miss the grace and the blessings that can come with the sacrament. And our generation cannot explain this, especially if it's a mixed marriage. Like, how do you explain that to someone that's not Catholic? So I'm not familiar with, the, with why, why there would be that specific rule. Well, they make all kinds of... Of rules, you know, that if they are cohabitating, they have to live apart for a year. I think we do have some clergy in the audience. They could probably give some examples, but yeah, yeah. So it sounds to me like there are a lot of there are a lot of rules that are making it difficult for people who are cohabitating um, to 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 enter into church communities, and they feel distant. And then we have a lot of rules about weddings. And we know also that weddings, along with baptisms, are decreasing. Church weddings are decreasing now, um, which is a big deal. Yeah. So what do we do about that? I mean, this is precisely the kind of local issue. I mean, these are not you know, huge high-level rules. A lot of these are local rules. So uh, it seems to me that this is precisely what parishes are invited to rethink. These are more pastoral decisions. So it's, it would seem to me that there is a mandate now coming from Francis with this document to say, now go and figure out how you cannot alienate the however what percentage of, of your young people who are going to cohabitate and figure out how you can bring them back because that's what he's consistently doing. So, and he provided a, he used a theological concept, it was controversial, um, the word kind of dropped out, but, but the concept remains in, in his document, and that's gradualism. So this idea that people gradually can come to a deeper, fuller realization of a moral virtue or ideal. And his idea was, and this was very present in the, sen in the Synod, uh, well, that's, it was, I'm sure it's his idea because it, it's in different places and it made it into the Synod conversations is that that's how you should approach people who are cohabitating. Instead of saying, you're living in sin, can't come in, here's the rule. Um, what's going on there? That's, in, that's good, that's interesting. See that, and then invite them in, and, and make it easy for them, easier for them, to ask for more. He, he does that consistently. One of my, one of my favorite passages, um, that, or phrases that he consistently uses is this, you, you, you uh, is the weeds. He talks about the weeds. <laughs> like there's always, people always have flaws, imperfections, the weeds, but you can still find God there, right? And he's consistently going for that, and he's inviting pastors to do the same thing. So instead of saying, you're living in sin, can you look at what the commitment is? Can you see the love that's there? That's what he's inviting pastors to do. Like I think about like he was, when he was in between the U.S. and Cuba, he was talking, he was meeting with Castro, and he was asked, you know, did you ask him about the persecution of the church and Cuba and all of this? And he said, he said no, you know, we, we talked about 
how he went to a Jesuit school and how tough those Jesuits are and how we both have a concern about the environment. You know, I mean, it's like he, he's going to find the connection. He's not going to go with the judgment first, right? That's what he wants us to do. And if a parish is doing something else, I would say that they're not operating. I, I think we need to call this out. You're not operating in the spirit of Francis then. There have been some people who have tried to say this document is not authoritative. That's a no, no way. <laughs> There's no way to make that argument. Right? This is an, it's not an encyclical. It's an apostolic exhortation. Very high level Vatican document. The Vatican itself, it says, yes, it is authoritative. Right? Um, there are people, there are some theologians who are signing, signing statements saying, you know, maybe this isn't, you know, maybe we need to have Francis clarify things, which I mean, fix things that he said. And you know, Francis not clarifying anything. Right? So those voices are being told, no, no, actually, this, this is the current teaching. This is where we are now. So I, I, I think that then the peop, people who know that need to, need to be, yeah, using it. Well, this is where it's good to be in a church with some authority. Maybe don't, we don't want the total top-down authority, but we do have a sense of this is where we are now. Okay. Let's invite our parishes to act on this. Because it is, that's what we need to feel. What, he, what Francis feels, what I, I see you feel, what I feel, is that I don't want to lose these people. I don't want them to miss out on what marriage is. It seems so easy. And to be honest, um, on the subject of women, I have a little harder time being positive about Francis. Um, there is one statement that's particularly difficult for theologians, right, where he, where he calls us, trying to be nice, the strawberries on the cake. No, <laughs> don't want to be the strawberry on the cake. <laughs> but um, he has said that we want to encourage greater roles of women. I think there are people studying this. There are more women being appointed to various commissions. You know, I mean, when you looked at the Synod, I mean, it's, it's incredibly, it, it was an all-male space. I mean, down to the reporters and the, yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, it, it's a problem. And it was particularly problematic. Uh, what, what one thing that worried me was that there are so many wonderful women theologians senior to me who have been working on these issues their whole lives. Lisa Cahill at Boston College would be one. Um, Margaret Farley at Yale. Um, you know, who were not consultants at the Synod, the way that theologians would have been consultants if they were working on other issues. That's really painful. No women theologians. There, there were women who were wives who were invited with their husbands to speak about marriage, you know, sort of from the ground level experience, but not women theologians. So, so yes, I do think it's crucial. Women will bring different perspectives and voices into the room. And if Francis can figure out a way without changing the rules, right, to get us into those conversations, that will be important. Yes. Well, there was some talk early on, you know, do women, do you, uh, could women be cardinals? Because you don't actually have to be a priest. Possibly. Um, I mean, certainly we can be theologians, which can be a certain amount of power. And the question is, what else can we be? Right. But yes, um, ultimately, that's, that's a change that many of us would seek. And it's hard to imagine full justice without that change. Pardon? 
using my authority, Julie. <laughs> So I'm going to invite forward Erica Toffelmeyer, who's our campus ministry coordinator, to formally thank Julia on our behalf. On, on behalf of all of us here, Dr. Julia, I'd really like to thank you for speaking with us. Um, I think when, when you first started and said, you know, normally we're speaking to two audiences of, of family and, and social justice, and I think that was something that I had always sort of felt, but had never heard articulated so clearly. And to know that Francis is working to bring those together, I think is is so heartening. And to know that he is is using the same moral framework to to frame both of these things, I think is really, really wonderful to hear. And I think I I especially appreciated your honesty and um your yeah, honest dealing with the challenges of the church and, and um, that Francis is clearly doing a lot of great things, but we still have a long way to go. But I think the main thing that, that I'm going to be taking away, along with reading his document, which I was afraid to read before now, um, is, is that you kept saying that he's um, made a big... Uh, He's really talked about how we need to have these discussions and arguing is okay. And you, you said um, that's who we are as the church. And I, I like to think that, that that's who we are. Um, and I think that's kind of what you were saying too, is that it's not just the higher level church, that, that we're the church and that we can be having these conversations and these dialogues as well. And so thank you for bringing that conversation to us um, and allowing us the opportunity to, to give our own input into that as well. So thank you very much. So some announcements. It's like always all these moments of feeling like I'm in church. We've got to do announcements before we can leave. So the first thing to say is to sign up in the atrium if you want to receive information about these lectures or any other lectures and events taking place at St. Jerome's. We do send out regular emails, so um, if you didn't get any or you want to get some about future events, then please sign up in the, in the atrium to make sure that we get what you want. Every year, St. Jerome's University is pleased to be able to present a program of speakers to the community, and we're glad that we can make them available to you. Uh, we're able to do so because of the generosity of very many supporters and partners. If you too would like to support the lectures, then where you sign up is also, there are some donation envelopes there, and you can fill in your name and uh, want to say thank you to all those who have given and any who continue to support our lectures. If you missed it on the way in, uh, Dwyer will be selling some fair trade products made available to you by our social justice committee. Uh, you know, Christmas is not too far away, so we can start stocking up for that. And you would have also noticed that John is here from our local independent bookseller, Wordsworth Books. So there are lots of wonderful books out there to take a look at. Um, also on that table, uh, Julie's book that just came out, um, Hope for the Hope, Hope for Common Ground. So she has, uh, we don't have the book here, but she's got some flyers, so you could always order that book. And then I want to tell you that the next lecture in Catholic Experience is going to take place on Friday, November 18th. And that is the correct date. So, David Mulroney, who is the president of the University of St. Michael's College in Toronto, is going to be with us to speak on the topic, Living with the Dragon. Mulroney has more than 30 years in Canada's public service, including time as ambassador to the People's Republic of China from the years 2009 to 2012. And so on November 18th, he's going to talk with us about how China's rise in the global uh, reality is reverberating across our country. And think about how we can respond in ways that continue to promote our own prosperity, our security, and also our values. So he's going to bring to this topic the perspective of a Canadian public servant who very much, he talked with me about, who struggled to live his own faith in sometimes what he experienced as an unfriendly environment. So I think it'll be an interesting conversation. 
And so finally, I want to thank all of you for coming this evening. It's wonderful to see you again, the faces that have come back this year. Um, I thank you for your help in spreading the word about our public lectures. I hope I'll see you in November. But for now, have a safe trip home. Grab yourself a, uh, a cupcake to go. Uh, and until next time, good night. Thank you.